Welcome to 412 Sports Talk, the number one podcast for Pittsburgh sports. Steelers, we talk it. Penguins, we talk it. Pirates, yeah, we talk it. With the biggest guests, Bob Pompiani, Pittsburgh legend. Mayor Bill Peduto, the mayor of the city of Pittsburgh, is on with us. Doran Dickerson, West Allegheny legend. Trey Essex, welcome. Available on iTunes and Spotify. Hosted by Mad Chad Nolan. Get out for too much. Well, now he's not turning it over at all. And Eddie Provident. We've got the best team in football. And now, 412 Sports Talk. All right, everybody. Well, welcome back to another edition of the 412 Sports Talk podcast. I'm your host, Eddie Provident. Oh, I should say, for, I'm going to get this right one of these times, Chad. The 412 <laughs> Sports Talk po- podcast brought to you by MCM Studios. Uh, I am still not used to having a sponsor. So uh, shout out to Mike Hitt and the guys at MCM Studios for uh, sponsoring the show as always. Um, but I'm your host, Eddie Provident. Uh, with all uh, with me as always, I already already said his name. My man, Mad Chad. I am uh, hired. Just so you all know, um, I just hired Mad Chad as my uh, as my financial investment advisor. Um, so uh, with all of the stock market stuff going on, I figured it'd be a good it'd be a good time to get somebody. And uh, Mad Chad is going to be my new financial advisor. What's your thoughts, buddy? All right, man. So I, I'm not gonna lie. I I got in on that yesterday. I I made a Did couple. Uh, made a couple shekels. There made a couple go, shekels. Man. Yeah. I, I I'm on a Reddit. To me, so if I was ranking all social media, right? Twitter, Facebook. Facebook would probably be last. Uh, or TikTok. I hate TikTok. I know everybody likes it. I hate it. I can't stand it. Uh, I think Reddit's the best. I get so much information from Reddit. It's crazy. That's how I, I, I learn about things like you can learn about things on Reddit that you couldn't learn in college. It's tremendous. If you're not on Reddit, I highly recommend it because it is, I mean, listen, here's how crazy Reddit is. There's, there's subreddits where like, like if you if you can't get, if you can't get a loan from a bank, you can go on Reddit, and if you have enough karma, someone on there will give you a loan. It is and it's is bonkers. Wild, it is a wild. It's like the wild wild west on on the internet. This, um, this, yeah, this, this whole <laughs> stock thing is wild to me. And we'll get into sports, but like we always spend a couple of minutes talking about what's going on in in the world. I love it. I love it, dude. So. You know, Mike Hit has been on me about getting into the stock market, and he, I, I still have. I didn't. I, I swear, if you're listening, Mike, I didn't leave you on red. I, I just had a lot going on today. <laughs> but he, you know, he's trying to get me in, and he's got this thing where you know he'll, you get four free stocks if you sign on Robinhood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I'm just, on there. I just haven't really had a chance to look into anything and and like research anything enough to uh, to really feel comfortable investing any money yet. And mm-hmm. you know, my dad in the last couple months has been getting into the stock market, mm-hmm. and, and here's why I bring this up. So. On Christmas Eve, or the day before Christmas Eve, he started buying stock. And what his plan was, was he was going to buy whatever was cheap and low that he knew would eventually, after the pandemic, would come back up. You know, Like so airlines, airlines, resorts. Right, right. So he got American Airlines. He's got some resort stuff. He's got some, uh, some, some energy companies. And one of the ones that he bought, because it was down to $2.30 a share in December. AMC. AMC. Yep. He he bought about 250 shares of AMC. Yeah, I have 92 right? shares. So this is back in December. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, he he log, he wakes up this morning. And, and again, my dad does not. He's not on a lot of social media. He has a Facebook just to keep in touch with family and friends. So mm-hmm. he's not on Reddit. He doesn't know about everything that was going on. I actually sent him a message last night. Uh, with an article and a video about the whole GameStop thing was like, Hey, you're into the stock market. You'll, you'll find, you should probably find this pretty crazy. You know, he doesn't get that text message until later. He wakes up this morning, (laughs) gets his coffee, goes, goes to check his E-Trade account. And uh, he sees that, uh, you know, cause he saw that there was like $4,000 in his E-Trade account and that wasn't there. So he's, his immediate thought was, Oh shoot. E trade, you know, hit my bank account on, or, you know, by some kind of weird, you know, mishap. So he tries to log in to see. He can't see anything because apparently at, at this time in the morning, everybody was trying to figure out what was going on. So yep. the trade was slow and going down. 
And that's how he found out that, uh, that <laughs> AMC went off uh, overnight. And um, so shout out to my dad, Big Ed, for uh, <laughs> having the wherewithal to buy AMC stock in December and then hitting it big uh, today. <laughs> um, Hell yeah. By what was going on. But, uh, you know, we've got. So we've got the stock stuff going on today. And, you know, so I'm trying to read all of that on Twitter. I'm trying to follow what's going on with that, trying to do my research to see if I want to invest anything. I get a text message from my man, Ryan Breen, uh, who is a listener and a uh, he's a good follow on Twitter. Huge Penguins fan. Um, but Ryan uh, texted me and said, hey, did you see the uh, Penguins news? Does this have anything to do with the Wilkesbury stuff? I'm like, what are you talking about? Because the only thing I had saw was Yannick Weber. And I know that at one point in time, Wilkesbury had some COVID issues. So I'm thinking, well, maybe defenseman and Wilkesbury got COVID and I'm trying to put two, <laughs> two together. And I just messaged him back. You mean Yannick Weber? And he says, no, no, uh, brace yourself, bud. And he sends me a, a, a like just a tweet storm. And um, that's how I found out about uh, <laughs> Rutherford today. And then I messaged you to say, hey, man, looks like we'll have a lot to talk about. Yeah, um, no shit. So, yeah, Rutherford resigns as Penguins GM today. Um, he listed it as personal reasons. Uh, we found out that it has nothing to do with any uh, any uh, personal health or family health, which is good news. I mean, that's that's good to hear that, that everybody's in good health, and that's uh, not a reason why. Um, but it sounds like they're, uh, he didn't leave on the best of terms, and it sounds like maybe uh, he was upset that either the Penguins weren't going to renegotiate his personal contract uh, mid season or that maybe they didn't want to bring him back. And rather than waiting till the end of the season, he just figured he'd, uh, he'd leave himself. Um, it was a very bizarre day for the penguins. Yeah. So obviously the first thing I tweeted out was I, you know, I hope everything's okay. Then when I was driving home from my day job, uh, I'm listening to the radio and it, you know, I hear that it has nothing to do with health. Okay, cool. So now we can actually diagnose this without sounding like assholes because if Jim Rutherford says, Hey, I'm 71 years old, I'm old as hell. I'm in bad shape or something's wrong with my family. It's going to be a lot harder to, to it, whether it's right or not, it's going to be hard to criticize anything about his, you know how it is. I mean, if someone's going through a rough time, you don't want to pile on, but since that was taken out of the equation. Let's be real. Let's be real about the Jim Rutherford era. It was time, right? It was probably time. They And again, we're going to talk about this with Danny from Penn's blog, but why I'm starting to under, why the hell did this not happen before, before the season season. started, yeah. before this man was making trades? Um, I, th I, I think the Penguins, I mean, they're to blame for this partially because they, they I think they they knew that they weren't going to resign him next year. You're not going to resign a, a 72 year old GM, especially if they don't win another playoffs. If they go another season without winning, the uh, you know, going far in the playoffs this year, if they even make the playoffs. So they probably should have nipped this in the bud. And this is that this is where that blind loyalty and, and we don't like, you know, we don't like shaking things up so much. The Steelers do this, this dumb stuff too. They're, they had all the reason and wherewithal and right to part ways with Jim Rutherford last, last year, two years in a row that they, that they did not win a, uh, a playoff. They had damn near didn't win a playoff game. They only won one playoff game in the last two seasons. And I don't and, even know, like, I, I know that the NHL is considering that. Oh, yeah, that's round true. Yeah. 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 As a playoff round. But I don't really, if you didn't make the, 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 the 16, I don't Technically, I, they yeah. didn't make the real playoffs right. last so year. I, yeah. I, yeah. That, that's even a debatable stat, the one um, playoff win. So, but, you know, and it's like in this town, you know, these, these, these championships, they're great. And I would never trade anything in the world as a sports fan the three Stanley cups and two super bowls that I've got to experience as, as a, a, an adult um, has been incredible. Um, I mean, I'm telling you like some of the best non -per family personal or, or memories of my life. Um, so much partying, especially that first cup, <laughs> but you know, championships go a long way, but it, it, I, I, then, then it's weird because like it, we, we pick and choose this, uh, I hear a certain radio host. He says, what have you done for me lately? A lot. Right. But then like it, it, that doesn't apply to Jim Rutherford because what he's the nice old cuddly GM. Like, 
I, I respect what he did, but here's the thing. When I, I remember I was still blogging for Penn's initiative whenever Jim Rutherford got hired and, and I was the one that wrote the, uh, what to expect from the Jim Rutherford regime. And I went back and I analyzed what he did at Carolina. Now, granted, he did not have Sidney Crosby at Carolina. He did not have Evgeny Malkin in Carolina, and he didn't have a team that would spend to the cap ceiling every single, I understand that, but he did everything right. His first couple years in Carolina, they won the Stanley cup partially because Cam Ward played out of his mind and never played that good again and won the con Smythe. Um, but he won the Stanley cup in Carolina. And I think he actually got them to a conference final uh, 2009 against the penguins. Mm-hmm. And then like the last three or four seasons, there, shit show, literally bad That's trade really after bad trade, after bad trade, buyout, buyout, buy. Does it sound familiar? So fast forward to Pittsburgh. He's the GM. First year, okay, yeah, you got Patrick Hornquist. That was a hell of a trade, right? That was a good trade. Uh, you know, they trade James Neal for Nick Spalling, whatever, fail. But Patrick Hornquist, I would say the Hornquist trade worked out pretty damn well for James Neal, right? Okay, and, uh, you know, they don't they make the playoffs his first year. Then he makes all the right moves. I'm telling you, when you can press all the right buttons, like a goddamn Mortal Kombat fatality, he did it. In 2015, 2016, he, he brought in Sullivan and kicked out Mike Johnson, who I sometimes can't even remember that he actually coached a team. He traded for Phil Kessel. He traded for Justin Schultz. He fra- traded for Ian Cole. Nick he Panino. traded Nick Panino, yeah. <laughs> um, Carl Haglin. Yeah. He traded, I he got mean. Got rid of you, Rob Scuderi and turned Rob Scuderi into <laughs> Trevor Daly. I, I mean. He hit every out of the park. They win the Stanley Cup. Next off season, he makes even more good moves yeah. <laughs> and they win the cup again. Jim, Ru- I remember Jim Rutherford is a wizard. Everybody used to call him that he's a wizard, right? He's great. Okay. So they got two back to back cups and where do we go from here? Okay. So he lets Nick Benito walk. Yeah. You know, Benito was good, but we ain't going to pay him 4 million a year. We'll get another third line center flurries leaving. Well, f- you know, Matt Murray, uh, to be fair, I can't hold the flurry thing to Rutherford because I think every yeah, GM would have yeah. made that move, and there was he no way to, to know yeah, that Matt to. Murray was going to regress that much the next couple of years. Okay, but then he trades Oscar Sundquist, who was probably supposed to be the heir apparent to the third-line center role, uh, and then a first-round pick for Ryan Reeves <laughs> yeah. and a second-round pick. And I remember that moment, every like the circle of Penguins fans that I associate with on Twitter, and you'll see me associate with a lot of the same people most often, more often than not, everybody would collectively was like, what? Why? Because Tom Wilson was mean to you during the playoffs that you went out and got a tough guy when you just won back to back cups by skating circles around everybody uh, surrounding your team with players that are good, anal- uh, with, with you know they had good analytics and they speed, skill. That was what those teams were built around, and you just threw that entire recipe out the window. Brought in Ryan Reeves, who obviously Mike Sullivan didn't want to even play him, and if he did dress, he played like two shifts a game because he was a goddamn goon. And he didn't fit with the team. And I, listen, Ryan Reeves is cool. I know that he he's actually had some decent stuff happen, you know, here and there. But he there was you could he it was like literally he he did not fit that team that the the roster what Mike Sullivan was trying to do it did not fit. Um, then he signs Jack Johnson a year later, which everybody everybody that doesn't kiss Jim Rutherford's butt said, hey. That's horrible. That's a horrible contract. What the hell are you doing? And what happened? Two years later, he's buying out his contract. Then as a parting gift to all of this, after after destroying a Stanley Cup roster after two seasons, here's his last couple moves. He trades Patrick Hornquist. Okay, a lot of people felt like it was time for Hornquist to move on. You're forgetting uh, that he brought in Eric Branson too. Oh him. yeah, Gabranson. Oh, that other t- another non good skating tough guy that didn't yeah. fit the team. There you go. He, then he traded away Dominic Cahoon for Connor Sheary again, which that one didn't make sense to me either. And it pissed the players off. Yeah, I remember yeah. it pissed the, the locker room off. 
Yeah, there was a few in there that I I just I don't understand. You know, and that's the thing, not to not to interrupt. No, you're you, good. Ted, but uh like before you get into the current situation, um he'll do something like that, but then right after it he trades a conditional sixth for John Marino. You know, it's it's like what what if it if it was just all bad trades, you know, and like all these trades that make no sense whatsoever, I could at least say okay, the dude's just not like he's not a good GM. But Every he'll he'll do, you know. It's like he'll do two or three things that make you want to pull your hair out, uh-huh. and then he trades for John Marino, or he trade, you know, he 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 signs John Marino to a great deal, or he, it just, you know, I, I don't. Then the Pedersen trade was good. Uh, he traded yeah. Yeah, yeah, sprung Pedersen, for Pedersen. Sprung for Pedersen worked out very well for the Penguins. So look, we're not here saying that that. Uh, Rutherford was a no. terrible GM. He made a lot of really good deals, and I think that that's what makes the bad deals so frustrating. Is we know you have it in you to make good hockey deals, but you didn't. And and but here's the biggest issue: is that clearly, clearly, the last couple of years he didn't have a and, and, and your sporadic bad bad trade, bad signing, great trade. Wait a minute, what the hell? The reason that is is because I don't think he had any kind of plan. Uh, it was all it, it was all impulse. It was all impulse. And again, th- the, this all went off the rails because Tom Wilson was jacking dudes up big time. Uh, and listen, I understand it. Tom Wilson is a very tough player to play against. And what makes him especially tough isn't that he's just this goon that goes out and crushes your guys and injures them. It sucks to say it, but he's actually a good player. Right. And, and that's the thing, Chad. Like, <laughs> my dad and I have this argument all the time because, and, and I will give my dad credit with this. Um, a lot of the time, you know, what his favorite thing to say is that the analytics crowd forgets the the human side of hockey. And I get, uh, that. I, know, I, I, I know. get that. I get that that after a while, if you're a player on the ice, it is really tired. It gets really tiring when you uh, are constantly getting beat up by teams. And that's how teams decided they were going to beat the Penguins. They were going to take cheap shots. They were going to get dirty. They were going to just pound the Penguins in a submission. And it's and for me though, the way to fight that back is firepower speed an aggressive four check always have the puck and have a very good power play that when teams start to take those liberties they pay for it on the scoreboard i remember um i had i the the first stanley cup run i had a ton of vir- a shit go viral i was making gifts and means this is when vine was still around right so i would literally make a vine like real quick and it would get us i was on kiss fm a couple of times and the one thing i did i remember the sharks it was it was already two games to one and joe thornton was straight up or no it was yeah no it was it was joe thornton joe thornton was straight up mugging Sidney Crosby, mugging him all over him, cross-checking him. And there was another part where Brent Burns was doing it too. And you know what Sidney Crosby did in retaliation? Nothing. He skated away yep. and beat their ass on the scoreboard. Go wa- go rewatch that. They'll show it on NHL Network every once in a while. You can go buy the, D- the, the, the DVDs. The Penguins skated circles around the Sharks. So who cares if Joe Thornton and Brent Burns were taking cheap shots and, oh, well, look how much grit they have. Because what the hell good did it do? And then in 2017, with Tom Wilson, the Penguins won that series. Yeah. And, and, Chad, what's what's crazy about it to me is if you remember back to – the the gap between 2009 and 2016 right? mm-hmm. 2015 16 season one of the knocks on Crosby and I think it was overblown by the rest of the NHL but I do think there was some validity to it was that he always overreacted he always he did react when people would, would yeah would, would hit him he yeah. you know when he would get into those scrums with uh I remember Dubinsky and I remember um uh, there was there's another one. Um, uh, the Rangers uh, was it? Um, Mark Stahl. Mark Stahl would hit him. On. That was like we started see him seeing him stop reacting to those kind of things and just play. And before that, people knew that they like the Flyers are a perfect example. They knew that they could get under the Penguins' skin. Absolutely. And they, and they beat us. And so as soon as something clicked for the Penguins to just not react to that stuff and just get to your game, play your game, be aggressive, be fast. 
that's when we started seeing the Penguins take over the NHL for two years. And then they got away from that again. And I'm not saying that the players got away from that because I don't think that we see Crosby react like that anymore. We don't. Malkin always does, and I think he always will. But, you know, the, for the most part, the roster stopped reacting to the stupidity that other teams were doing. Um, and but the but the general manager and it, it was almost like management decided well no we've got to react to that we've got to respond to that and that's where you know you've got players that play fast and aggressive and then you bring on other players that are slower and more physical kind of lumbering guys and it just didn't mesh man didn't I want mesh. to let people if you're listening to this show I promise you that there is no such thing as a deterrent. No grown man that plays in the National Hockey League is not going to go after your star player because you have a big guy on your team. These are grown professional athletes. Nobody is scared of anybody else. When that worked, Chad, that worked back in the 70s and 80s when people could literally assault each other on ice. Yes. That happened when Wayne Gretzky was the smallest dude on the ice and uh, Dave Semenko and Marty McSorley just yeah. beat, just literally that, beat the listen, shit out of Listen, this might as well be a, a new, uh, this might as well be a different sport and you might not like that but that doesn't change reality that that doesn't work anymore. Now here's where I, so again it's not that we're saying, oh, well, grit is bad. It's okay to have grit. Tom Wilson's a good example. If anything, I would be more of a fan of his game if he wasn't just such a cheap shot in P- POS. Yeah, no, I agree with you. The yeah. cheap shot's really cheap in everything about him because he's actually an effective player if you just take all that away. Well, his, teammate, his own teammate, Alex Ovechkin, is a perfect example of that. Alex yeah. Ovechkin is a train on skate. He'll, he'll knock your ass out with a hit. Yeah, I Absolutely. was watching, uh, dude, I was watching, um, I don't if you ever watch those reaction videos, like people, yeah, never yeah, watch, yeah. people never watched hockey before, watch hockey <laughs> for the first time, and they were reacting to um, you know some of the NHL's biggest hits. And I heard Ovechkin's name like five or six times <laughs> to the point where even the person reacting was like, yeah. Who's this Ovechkin guy? He must be tough. He's the best goal scorer maybe of all time, but he's also a freight train on skates. That's what you want in a player. You don't want a guy that's just going to go around and hit people and take penalties all game. Right. And we see like we, we've seen. And so when the, I think the casual fan, you know, they see I remember like, OK, so I'll, we're, we're going off track a little bit, but I'll give you an example to me. And we might even make this a topic, but one of the most overrated players and it, overrated does not mean bad. Overrated means they just weren't as good as people imagined they were. For me, at least, that's what that word means. Brooks Orpic is to me the epitome in, in this town because he had that huge shift against the Red Wings, which is it, dude. It's fun to watch. Go, oh, yeah, go watch yeah, the. Sh- it's Brooks Orpic the shift, and he just is knocking Red Wings on their ass every time they touch the puck. It's magnificent. The fans were beating the glass. It was. It's. It's tremendous. But, like, that defied him his entire career. And they were like, yeah, Brooks Orpik, he hits people all the time. He's so good. But, like, the next couple of years, he was, like, literally shit five on five. And I would tell people, like, hey, I remember I wrote an article, like, get Chris Letang away from Brooks Orpik because Letang's metrics were just being dragged down so right. much by Brooks Orpik. And, but the, the problem was people would go, oh, well, you need a guy that can hit like that. No, you need a good player. If they hit like that on top of that, that's great. Then that's, 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 that's great. Man. The days of this grit. And, and, but here's, here's, here's what I'm going to defend Jim Rutherford, right? Obviously, the front office was okay, right? Mm-hmm. Because they 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 signed off on his plan. They let him make these trades. They didn't interfere and say, hey, do, uh, by the way, uh, everybody's telling us Jack Johnson sucks. Are you sure you want to give him a five-year contract? They said, you're the GM. Go ahead. Do what you want. Yeah. So the Penguins can't really have a gripe. If you had a gripe, you should have did something beforehand. Yeah. And, like, I, I can't <sighs> – hockey's so frustrating from this standpoint that – 
everybody thinks the glory days of hockey were, you know, the the Montreal Canadiens versus the Quebec Nordiques just absolutely destroying each other. Or the, the Red Wings and Avalanche in the, the 90s, Red, dude, the bloodbath. Yeah, dude, I actually just watched. Did you see that, uh, the Russian <laughs> Five? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. was – if you uh, – are into hockey as much as we are just as an aside the russian five documentary that the nhl network just played the other night is a must watch that was such a good good documentary i, I enjoy thoroughly enjoyed that but you know watching games like that watching games you know like the bruins and the flyers of the 70s like that's not hockey anymore um hockey now is more and more becoming what we saw and we talked about this with jesse marshall a couple weeks ago what we saw in the world juniors is what hockey is becoming fast paced aggressive for checking you know uh good sound defense not this plugging beating people into submission anymore it, we're getting away from that and we're getting closer to the sport that we all want to see which is just skill and speed at its best and guys like orpic uh, as much as he was a fan favorite are not going to survive in a league that's built on s speed and skill because they're not that skilled and they're not that fast. They just hit people a lot. Patrick Cornquist is 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 the is a great example of that dude gave you all of those buzzwords that you wanted. Yep. He hit, he was gritty, he had a heart. I mean, you can go literally whatever hockey buzzword you can think of, but guess what? Hornquist had skill. He scored 20-plus yep. goals a season. He scored the game-winning goal to win the Stanley Cup. He wasn't just a goon. So you, what we do? You, you have to be able to skate. You have to be able to handle the puck at some extent or else you're going to become obsolete. Yep. So I don't know where where the, the rails came off. I mean, Rutherford takes blame. But as I said, the Penguins knew what he was doing. I guess they were like, well, we'll just let it run its course. That's probably what they were going to do because they felt like, hey, this guy helped us win back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. He's 71 years old. He's a Hall of Famer. He's the cuddly grandpa. So we'll just let him ride out his contract and say adios. But Rutherford, and, and I can't blame him, was like, hey, I won you guys two Stanley Cups. I want a new contract. I'm a lame duck right now. It's a pandemic. I mean, I'm bored or whatever. So I can't blame Rutherford, but no, he did not. His, 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 um, how I would define Rutherford's legacy was hit and miss. First three years he hit, last three years he missed. And the biggest problem is he kind of just left them like, ha ha, good luck with your salary cap situation. Yeah. I just traded Hornquist for Matheson. I signed Cody CC. Uh, you know, I have like CC's a one year cheap deal. So that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, he, and, and yeah, the Marino deal should be okay. As long as Marino doesn't regress. I, I'm not, I, I don't he think will. he will. Yeah, I think he's going to be fine. But, but if you go on like cap friendly next year, like uh, for next season, they they only have like nine million dollars in cap space, yeah, the, the and that's Pens assuming the cap doesn't get lowered. Yeah, that that's the Pens are in some trouble when it comes to the cap. And uh, side note, you you had mentioned uh, cuddly grandpa. I <laughs> I will I will retweet this, uh, but my my wife sent me something today that I just I could not unsee. For anybody that watches Shit's Creek. Um, she put a picture of Jim Rutherford next to a picture of Bob from Schitt's Creek uh, garage. And uh, man, they are the same human. And I can't, un I cannot unsee that now. So that's funny. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's an interesting situation, man, because he did, let's be honest for that first few years, everybody was on the, on the GMJR train and rightfully so two cups in his first, you know, his first couple years as a GM, um, all of the right moves, like you said, literally just home run after home run after home run with his trades. Um, so there, you, you do have to give him that credit. It wasn't all bad with GMJR. It's just a shame that the situation the Penguins are in now is how he leaves it. And, and he just left. I still, I wouldn't, I can't get over the fact that he left seven games into the season. Yeah. That that's another one that doesn't sit well with me, but I, you know, I, I don't know all the ins and out. I don't. We're going to know because if there's one thing we know about Rutherford is he likes It'll to talk to the media. Yeah, I'm I'm just shocked that this didn't have more to do with what was going on at Wilkes-Barre because honestly that was my gut reaction was like that the you know the hammer was going to come down on that. 
And, um, you know, I'm so I guess we're still waiting to see what happens and, there. And I will say, I mean, listen, I, you know, I'm a, I, the pick, as you can see, I mean, the Pittsburgh Penguins are, are my, they're, they're my favorite organization. And that's why it pains me that, like, I think this is, we, we know we've, especially myself, have criticized them a lot because they, you know, they've had, Things go on in an organization when it comes to sexual assault allegations. The PPP loan thing still bugs me to this day. Um, they kind of had some not really good awareness about posting, uh, I would call right leaning political um, things on Twitter um, in, in a bad time where obviously our country was divided. I feel like sports organizations should just skip that entirely and not make a, a stance. So they, and now again, you know, I think the biggest problem with the penguins is I think they're just complacent mm -hmm. in that front office and I can't blame them. Business has been good. They've been profitable up until the pandemic. Um, they, they've won three world championships. If you go back uh, Forbes and ESPN used to, I don't even know if they still do, but they used to rank, all the best organizations in each like NHL and MLB and the Penguins would always be even out of all the sports would be listed up there with like the Spurs and the Patriots. Yeah, they're they're yep. I I don't know if that's the case anymore. Um I, I don't know if I was a GM like if I was a GM right now I'd go I, you know what if I could choose any job I would choose the Penguins because all their stars are old. They are they're they're in salary cap hell. Um, I think that it's going to be a rough ride here with the Penguins and the well, Steelers. My my buddy, hold on, my buddy was like, they sent me uh, something the other day. He was like, "Hey, you picked a great time to start a Pittsburgh sports podcast with the Steelers and Penguins both starting to suck." <laughs> yeah. Well, here, here's the thing that I, I will hang my hat on, and maybe this is me just being a fan, and, uh, Fair. and yeah, and that's that's what I am. I'm a fan. Um, I cannot see any of this sitting well with Mario. And and here's the thing. If Mario still is invo actively involved with this organization, and we don't really know what his, you know, what his involvement is anymore, because for all we know, he could just be the owner and kind of checked out and, you know, enjoying the fruits, the fruits of his labor. <laughs> yeah, he enjoys fruits. All right. Fruits and, in a glass. Yeah, right. <laughs> but if he, uh, I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> um, if, if he is at all involved, if I'm a GM and I know Lemieux's track record, I am going to say, you know what? He's not going to stand for losing very, very long. He's not going to stand for losing often. And, Look at when he took the team over. When he when he when he bought the team, it took him a few years, but the team turned around. So I don't even I don't see as long as Mario is involved and act or he as long as he's in the ownership and actively involved, I can't see the Penguins being a bad hockey team for long. Maybe a couple years to kind of retool and rebuild um, and kind of wipe the slate clean because they're going to have to do that with this roster, uh, whether we like it or not. There's a lot of. I don't think they're going to do that though. I think we're going to have a, a similar situation with Roethlisberger where they're going to just let these guys. But it's coming. That and my point is whether yeah. they let these guys dwindle and they just let them play their careers out, or they they actively do it in the next couple of years on their by their own. <laughs> it's coming, man. It's and and I you know yeah. I can't see it lasting long, but it's coming. We're going to have a few years where. The Penguins are not going to be a good hockey team. It, I was going to say if they if they continue like their record's not good, you know what? At that point, st whoever's still in the league that was like a fan favorite, just bring them on back, whether their contract sucks or not, and we'll just have like a full season of nostalgia send offs right. with like Flurry, Latang, Crosby, Malkin, uh, uh, whoever else is still in the league at that point, and we'll just have the season where yeah, we know we're going to be shit, but you can come watch thirty eight year old Sidney Crosby right. and thirty nine year old Mark Andre Flurry for I, one more season. Fun. Mark Andre Fleury don't look too. I mean, and it's early, but he yeah. doesn't look too bad this year. Well, man. He's well, we'll playing, yeah. You know how he is. Yeah, I know exactly how he is. He's going to be the goalie of the month in January, yeah. and then in February, the save percentage yeah. is going to be in the eight hundred. But credit credit where it's due, and I, and it's a lot to do with the team in front of him. The the, the Knights are are freaking incredible. That's probably. I was thinking about this today. Like, if if you were a GM, 
right? And you had carte blanche. You could pick whatever franchise in this league you wanted to go with. Vegas would probably be damn near at the top of the list. They're just they're 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 doing everything, and they and they're doing. And this is why. I was on the train of getting another goalie, and I know I, it kind of contradicts myself because I said I never pay big money for goalie, but I don't think you have to. Is that I think in today's NHL you kind of have to have two quality goalies. The last time the Penguins won a Stanley Cup, they needed two goalies. Yep. Hell, the playoffs before that, they used three goalies. Jeff yep. Zakoff won them a game. Yes, he did. And Vegas, you know, they could have traded Flurry or Leonard, and they held yeah. on to both of them, and it's probably going to pay off big for them. Yeah. Um, but that's, I mean, that that organization right now. Eh, Seattle, look, I, Seattle's got. That's what I would take is yeah, Seattle. Seattle's yeah. got big shoes to fill because, uh, and and that sucks for Seattle because you know I, I don't know that Vegas caught lightning in a bottle or if they just were were very well managed. But I, people have to like if you're a Seattle a Kraken fan or if you're gonna go if you're going to become a Seattle Kraken fan. I would caution you to not use the Vegas Golden Knights as the measuring stick for the Seattle Kraken because, man, I can't see them coming into the NHL and going to the conference finals in their first season and, you know, just absolutely taking the world by storm, taking the league by storm uh, for three or four years. So it, it sucks. I mean, in one sense, it's great for the game that Vegas did that. But now, you know, if Seattle doesn't make the playoffs in their first year, People need to understand that's what a that, that's what a uh, a uh an expansion team normally does. Uh Vegas is not the norm for, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, the only thing I, man, I would love to be a GM of a team like Seattle where you literally get to start from scratch. Nothing. No bad contracts. You you can you get the entry level draft where you have to you know you get to pick these and and the, the problem Seattle is going to run into is that teams are going to be aware of how it works this time. Yeah. Um, I think you know I don't think they'll have as easy as time as getting over on teams as Vegas did. Uh, I mean Vegas getting Max Pacioretty and Flurry and and yeah. Shea Theodore and. Uh, that, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen, but it would be cool to be, be able to like, hey, here's a blank sheet. Build us a hockey team. But, but let's be real here. <laughs> Vegas got lucky, too, because William Carlson was a what, a six goal guy before. Yeah. Him, and then he becomes a 40 goal scorer. And Same with Jesse Marsuchowit. Um, uh, Mar- oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Marshall. Yeah. Marshall. Marshall. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. He, yeah the the from Florida. I don't understand why. I mean, we're really going down a rabbit hole now, but why did Florida let him go? He able to they had because they had Dale. No, that's a good segue because they had Dale Talon as their GM, and, and that's, that's who's that reported to be on the that. Penguins list. And do not hire him, please, because yeah, please you're talking about the guy that gave Sergey Bobrovsky a seven-year, eighty million dollar contract. Yeah, that's oh well. That's going to be something to be paying attention <laughs> to because uh, the uh, and you know we'll t- again. This is something else we'll talk about with Danny, but uh, the list of candidates for the Penguins job is uh, there's a lot to be desired on that list. And one last thing that we can talk about before we, before we end this, this segment is if they bring someone out, someone from the outside, which unless they promote Sam Ventura, which I would definitely I would be. Love a, that. Yeah. That's yeah. I don't think they will though. They might, they might make him the assistant general manager maybe. Um, but uh, if they, assuming they bring someone that does not have any ties to the Penguins, um, that, GM could get rid of Mike Sullivan. I mean, he's going to have no ties to Sullivan. Yeah. And if I'm a GM and I'm coming in, usually you want to be able to hire the coach that you want. Even if that coach that you inherit won two Stanley Cups, what have you done for me lately? The Penguins look like they might go their third straight year without winning a playoff series. At that point, I could see a Sullivan firing be justified, especially by a new uh, new GM yeah, that would maybe want to start over. Just, just you know, get his own people in there. You know, start from start. So that, from- yeah, that's going to be interesting. I don't even know if Sullivan. I mean, I think as we go, if he even survives the season, it depends on what this team does. If they're a playoff team, he'll survive the season. If they start tanking, if they if they're not playing good hockey, and you know they're playing the way they are now and not getting you know lucky with some wins and and uh getting you know getting games to shootouts 
Um, I could very well see a situation where, where they start to fall apart a little bit and they let him go. Uh, and I think, I think Sullivan's me. a good coach too, but I, you know, you, you played, you played hockey, albeit we played hockey at lower, a lot lower levels hockey in the NHL, level, yeah. but hockey is hockey. And the one thing I'll say about it, and we, and we've, every single guest seems to agree is, you know, sometimes you just need to hear a different voice. How many times can Mike Sullivan say the same thing? And if it starts to not work, right, you're not getting the results. You go, ah, man. I yeah, dude. Saying that it, a coach needs to leave is not a bad thing. I mean, look. No, at Barry, Sullivan would get hired in a minute. He would get hired in a minute. Barry, look at Barry Trotz. You know, he yeah. he he knew that it it was done in in uh, Washington. He goes to uh, the Islanders and he he. Turns them into a playoff team, a cup contender. Look, I, at, think, I mean, they go far yeah. as back. Maybe the greatest coach of all time in the NHL, Scotty Bowman, was on four or five different hockey teams. So, <laughs> I think uh, it, I think not, hockey coaches are the most replaceable yeah, coaches of the four it, major sports. It's not one of those things where if you say, "Hey, you know, it's time for Mike Sullivan to go," and I'm not, and I'm not saying that it is time for him to go yet. I'm just saying it's an option on the table. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't like Mike Sullivan, and that doesn't mean that I don't think if he, the Penguins let him go. That he's not going to go somewhere and and be a another play you know bring that team to a playoff. I think that Mike Sullivan is a really good coach. It's like what you said. Did his did he did he overstay his welcome here in Pittsburgh? Did his voice kind of is, are they kind of getting tired of hearing them? That that's all legitimate. You know, that, five and a half seasons as a head NHL coach is, in the NHL is a goddamn lifetime. Yeah, that's a lot, man. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot different than the NFL and, and yeah. Major League Baseball, and you know, yeah. I, I'm not really sure how long NBA coaches stick around, but I mean, it's it's different. It's a you know, yeah. it's a different beat. So that to me, that's the, probably to me the stop. The the top storyline is, you know, a new GM means he has no ties to this coaching Anything. staff yeah. and these players that's and that's the one that's going to be interesting for me is obviously i think you have i would say you probably have two or three untouchables obviously uh sid gino and latang and i would say latang more because i don't know that you can trade latang i'm that's sure you, a, you know for all the trade Latang trade Malkin people, you do understand that they have like no movement clauses, right? Like it's it's that, and even if they were to waive their no movement clause, let okay. So let's look at this real quick. Say you're Evgeny Malkin, and the Penguins say, "Hey, we want to trade you." Right. Um, look at the contenders in the NHL right now, and who has the cap space to and, to bring him on, and some kind of fair return that that would satisfy the penguins in that trade and would they even be willing to do that also Sidney crosby has been on record multiple times saying that he does not want them to trade of getting malkin yeah and so you know like the uh, that's another thing that a gm coming in is going to have to understand that you know look you've got at least three contracts that you're probably not going to be able to move and those three contracts <laughs> account for a decent chunk of letang's the, the only one that they can move but his the way his works is he's allowed the have a list of teams that he absolutely yeah. refuses to go to. I just, so then you're cutting the you're cutting your 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 teams in half, and then you're not going. What the hell are you going to get for him? That's at this my point? thing is at this point in time, especially the way he's playing right now. I don't, I don't think that you're going to get much for him. He's older. He's you know he's not playing well, and and I still think with Latang playing Latang right now. And letting him play through this slump that he's he's in is still your your the best value is letting him play on your team rather than getting rid of him. And let's be honest, Latang's like the Big Ben of the Steelers, where there's just a group of Penguins fans that they'll, they'll even when he's playing at yeah. his best, he's been nominated for Norris. He'll find a way to complain. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, he turns the puck. He's been bad right now. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. a big fan. He's been he's been shit. But but there is a f portion of this fan base that uh, just. Their, their yeah. opinion of Latang means but nothing to me. Here's the thing with Latang and Malkin, and I, I think we can close this segment on sure. this. We both know that at any given game, Latang and Malkin can can turn it on and account for five or six goals between the two of them. I I, I very I very think that it, you know, I very much think that the two of those players are going to at some point in time wake up, and I don't think that this is going to be a season long thing for them. So. We just have to ride this out, and hopefully it doesn't last long because it's a 55, 56-game season, and we can't have it last long. So, you know, we'll see what happens, and, um, you know, it, it's just kind of going to be a waiting game right now because 
we don't even know if they're going to try to replace Rutherford, you know, with a full time GM this season. They they may wait until the off season. Um, so yeah, it, there's a lot going on with this Penguins organization, and um, this hockey season just got a lot more interesting. Yeah, uh, I di- I didn't expect this. It gave us uh, a, a great topic for a show. <laughs> um, we literally are just going to just call this the Jim Rutherford episode because yeah. that's pretty much what you're going to get. That's pretty much it. I think Jim Rutherford will end up being remembered for bringing two championships and being a quality human being. I haven't been a fan of his his l- the last three years, but you have to be objective and overall. I think any team, so he was the GM here for five and a, six and a half seasons. And so in and two cups, uh, three years where they advanced past the first round, two cups. That so I think yeah. I, he didn't miss the playoffs. So I think any team in the league would take that. Would, yep. um, I just think that given his age and given his track record, I think originally once that set once they failed to do a three peat that that year that he they lost in the second round and they tried the Broussard trade and all that stuff. I think at that point it was probably time for him because I remember originally he said he was only going to do two or three years. Yeah, yeah. So I thought at that time it was the perfect opportunity to to let him step down and and promote Jason Botterill, who is actually another candidate. Um, and so, uh, but I, but I, uh, but the more I look at it, I, I just, I, you know, it's polarizing cause he, he was great or shit. There was no in between. So, yeah. but overall I, th- I wouldn't trade the last six years for anything no, else. No, I wouldn't either. And, and you know, it's, if, if nothing else, it's given us a lot to talk about, you know, Hell yeah. <laughs> um, it, keep, it keeps it interesting. So look, we're going to take a break uh, again. This is, you've been listening to the MC or the four, one, two sports talk podcast brought to you by MCM studios. Um, we will be back right after this with Danny Shire, yeah, Danny Shirey Irving of uh, Penn's blog. What's going on, four one two Sports Talk family? I'm sitting here in my living room with my main man Talbot. Talbot, say what's up, buddy. For those of you who don't know, Talbot's named after Max Talbot uh, because my wife and I had to compromise. We'll call it. She didn't want Lord Stanley or Gordy as a pet. But anyways, I'm sitting here in my living room and I just wanna talk to you guys for a quick minute about MCM Studios, our sponsor. There's so many different reasons why people need a recording studio nowadays, Uh, especially with the pandemic. Uh, Everything's going virtual. And honestly, what sets you apart from everybody else is your audio quality, your audio quality and your video quality. And having somebody that knows their stuff help you out is what it's all about. And I'm telling you, Mike Hit and the guys down at MCM Studios They know their stuff, and they know how to help people. And just for our listeners, right now, your first booking gets 15% off if you mention 412 Sports Talk or if you mention my name or Chad's name. So check them out, 412mcmstudios.com. Mention us, Chad, myself, or the podcast. Get 15% off and set yourself up to be a cut above everybody else when it comes to all of your virtual needs, all of your audio needs, all your video needs. Take care, guys. All right, well, welcome back to the 412 Sports Talk podcast, brought to you, as always, by MCM Studios. Uh, I'm your host, Eddie Provident. With me, as always, is my man, Mad Chad. And with us today, a very special guest. Uh, perfect timing for this guy, too, uh, with all of the uh, GMJR news. We've got Danny Shirey Irving from... Uh, from Penn's blog, you can follow him uh, at uh, on Twitter at Shirey Irving. Danny, thanks for joining the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk some pens with you guys. <laughs> so right off the bat, what's your thoughts on the uh, Rutherford story, man? Uh, this is kind of out of left field. I, I haven't seen the uh, I haven't seen hockey Twitter this blindsided by news in a very very long time. Uh, yeah, for, uh, all the turmoil that it is, it certainly, uh, makes for an exciting day when, uh, things of this nature happen. But, uh, like you said, it was super surprising to me, not something I was expecting by any means. Um, my initial thought was something along the lines of he's got health issues or he's got something going on with his family back home. 
But as has been made the case by him and insiders is that there's nothing wrong with him. And it even sounds like he might be looking for another job here come summertime. Uh, he made, uh, I think I saw a quote where he was saying that he doesn't like to sit around too long. He, he's real active. So I'm not really buying the fact that he just wanted to get up and leave in the middle of the season for no reason. So my mind is going to two things. The first of which was the situation with Clark Donatelli and the allegations against him. Who knows what's all going on with that, but it hasn't really been touched on by the organization. And I'm not sure if he's just trying to get in before the walls, get out before the walls cave in on him. And the other thing I was thinking is that he went to the Penguins and said, I want a new contract. And they told him, we're yep. going gonna to wait to see how the season goes or at least wait a little bit longer to see how things are progressing. And he just straight up said, no, and I'm done. I'm getting out of here. Yeah. And uh, to me, I mean, I don't know about how you feel about it, Danny, but like, I, I feel like he kind of like, he basically qu it's from everything we know right now. He, he quit on them seven games into the season. I mean, he left, he, he's leaving them high and dry. Uh, what, you know, you would have thought that they, maybe they would have had this conversation before the off season, especially we, we were rolling out that it's not health related and that nothing, that there's no emergency going on. It's just, you know, it's, it, he feels like it's his time to leave. You're going to do that seven games into the season. Like I, to me, that feel to me, I, I'm seeing it as, as he's leaving them high and dry. Yeah. It, it definitely doesn't pass the uh, smell test. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like if he wants to leave, so be it, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like the uh, the sentiments would be very different if Mike Sullivan were to do that, for instance. So I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there are things that we will never find out that went into this. That's just kind of the uh, nature of us being fans and not having all that inside knowledge. But there, there's definitely some bigger things going on here that we aren't aware of. Yeah, and for me, like, I agree with you 100% that there, there, this doesn't pass the smell test, the, the explanations we were given. Um, with all of that said, though, with him leaving, you know, kind of like Chad said, leaving the Penguins high and dry, my initial question, and this is something that as fans we can, we can actually discuss tangibly, is what is his legacy now as the Penguins GM? Obviously, you know, two Stanley Cups speak for themselves, but at the same time, the last couple of years, I would say the last three years or so have been, kind of a train wreck as far as uh what he's done i would only really give one or two trades passing grades um so where where does this leave now that he leaves kind of unceremoniously like this what is his legacy as penguins gm um well i guess it depends on who you're asking because as you can see with the the flurry fans or you know the the murray fans or whoever it might have been that has gone by the wayside or left the organization there's a pretty divided line between how people are feeling about people's departures. So I think there's going to be a portion of the fan base that are going to go, Hey, you know, he came in, built a roster that won two cups. We should thank him for that. And, you know, aside from the last three years where he might not have been at his best, we're still thankful for that. And I think there's going to be a portion of the fan base where they're going, you know, yeah, he got us two cups, but what happened after that? Why did the wheels fall off so hard? Why did we let that get to a point where you're essentially fighting back on what won you your two cups? Yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer for what happened. You know, like that's that's the thing is there's how do you go from building a team that is the fastest team in the NHL is uh, constantly crushing teams with their forecheck to trading for Ryan Reeves and signing Jack Johnson and, and just all these other questions. If there was an answer for it, I think it would sit better with me. But there's genuinely, to me, there's really no answer other than he he just I don't gave up on what worked. I'm not so sure he gave up on what worked. I legitimately think he was afraid that the Penguins couldn't stand up for themselves. Um, you know, Tom Wilson taking – taking Aston Reese out of that playoff series, breaking his jaw. I think he really just got deer in the headlights like, oh, crap, this is NHL hockey. I got to have guys <laughs> up there that can 
can handle business. And I'm, I'm not sure if it goes deeper than that, but as everybody is starting to realize those kinds of players are going by the wayside in the NHL. Yeah. I always, I always say that Jim Rutherford had the, he had the, the, the winning recipe and he just, he just tore it up after 2017. He was like, you know what? I can make a new one. And it didn't work. Um, looking at, I'm looking, I'm on Twitter right now. Right. So we're, we're looking at, obviously now we have to go, well, who are they going to replace him with? They have an interim GM. I'm really worried that the next guy could actually be worse than what they did with the last three years with Rutherford. Here's some uh, top choices. And I want to get your, your thoughts on this. So we got Tom Fitzgerald, Ron Hextall, Jason Botterill, Peter Trelli, John Ferguson, and Dale Talon. <laughs> Those are the front runners, according to NHL.com. I don't want any of them. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Pass, pass. All right, you have to, but if we have to choose one, right? I, I think the lesser evil here is probably either Fitzgerald or Botterill, just because Botterill at least was here and, and a lot of people give him uh, probably undeserved credit for some of the stuff that Rutherford did. And I, Tom Fitzgerald doesn't bother me as much as some of these other guys. If they hire Peter Torelli, I'm going to light my head on fire. Same with Dale Talon. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, where, where, where do you think, have you even looked at the names or, or, you know, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I might be a little biased. I'm, I'd probably <laughs> pick some, uh, some, <laughs> Maybe not so common names. I'd probably lean towards some guys like Eric Tolsky or even vouch for Sam Ventura. Sam Ventura. Or, Ventura would be a good one. Guys. And, and I, it doesn't have to be an analytics guy to make me happy, but none of the guys that we're talking about right now are fairly interesting to me. And I'm with you. I think Fitzgerald and Botterill would probably be the two of that, two best of that list, but I'm still not all that excited about either of them. So they bring a new GM in. Um, I think like when Rutherford got the job, the Penguins job was still considered to be like one of the, you know, if you're a GM and that, that, that spot opens up, hell yeah, sign me up. You got Crosby, Malkin, Latang, that core right there. Uh, you know, then you get, you get the, you have the Penguins, they spend to the cap every year. Um, this is a team that, you know, is, is okay with a GM they don't interfere. So you have free reign. It was probably the number one coveted job. I, I don't know about you, but you guys, I don't know if that's the case anymore. They're still going to spend to the cap most likely in, in, in a foreseeable future, but you got a team that has outside of Crosby two of the two other key pieces are, are aging and regressing. Um, the cap situation is not great. So I'm not quite sure if this job is as coveted as like people outside of Pittsburgh think it is. Yeah, I I would agree with you. I don't think it would be as coveted as it was when Rutherford took over. But with that being said, I do believe that um, around the hockey world, the Penguins organization, and it might be because they just won those two cups, regardless of whether it's true or not, but the organization has a, a credibility and integrity to them that everybody, whether it's true or not, everybody believes. So I think that might be helping their case uh, to maybe get a little bit more people interested, but I tend to agree with you that it's definitely not as desirable as it once was. So are we going to see the Penguins hire a new GM this season, or do you think that's something better served waiting to the off season? Um, I really <laughs> don't know. I don't know a whole lot of, about Patrick. All Alv it's Alvin, right? Yeah, Alvin. Alvin yeah, Alvin. I think is how. Oh, is it Alvin? Alvin okay. Alvin, yeah. yeah, to make yeah, some so I know very little about him, and it it kind of shell shocked me a little bit earlier after you know the Rutherford news kind of settled down. I was like, oh crap! I don't really know a lot about our GM right now. I I don't know his thought process. I don't know what kind of guys he likes because. This is a guy who's been with the organization for 15 years, but he's just been a scout. So it's not like we're getting quotes about him on roster building <laughs> or contract negotiation or anything like that. So I, I have no idea what to expect. I don't know if he's the right guy to finish out the season. I don't know if they need to bring in somebody right now. So that I don't know. Yeah, let's let's focus on what this this team is doing now. We, we, the GM, it's it, we're going to hear a lot more of that going forward. Um, 
I'm a big fan of your work because you do you do a lot of analytic stuff. That's why we like bringing on Jesse on because you give us a little bit more insight. Penguins just signed Yannick Weber today. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, he he's probably the most meh defenseman <laughs> to think of. Uh, he's okay defensively in a very sheltered role, third pairing guy. Uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, he's going to be a drag on offense. He's not going to do anything special. Um, he does have some pretty okay transition numbers, but um, as we've noticed with guys like Mike Matheson, it might not always translate as well to the Penguin system. Um, but other than that, he he's not flashy. He's not going to do anything crazy. I I view him as a body. Okay. Yep. Fair enough. Yeah, I was looking at some of his analytics and uh, transition. He scored high. I was reading a scouting report saying that he's actually uh, good with gap control as well. Like when guys are entering the zone, he defends the the blue line well. But other than that, he's a mess. So it, that's pretty much sums it up. Um, I was I, I, I'm looking at this defense, and I I don't know. Once everybody gets healthy, I don't know what this. Especially with bringing in a new GM, Mike Matheson, Cody CC. I, I don't – I think part of the reason why Rutherford and the Penguins had a falling out is I don't think that – and we talked to Josh Shelley about this, that the coach and GM were seeing eye to eye um, because Rutherford's moves haven't seemed to mesh with what Sullivan wants to do and how this team was supposed to be constructed. So where do you see this defense going? At? What do you think they need to do going forward as far as, like, the lineup goes? Well, I mean – First and foremost, it's just going to be getting bodies out there that aren't going to get caved in every shift. Sure. I don't know if for the rest of this season that we're going to see, you know, an optimal line lineup where they've got all their guys healthy and you can have all the guys in the positions that you'd want them to be. Yeah. Um, but with that said, I I don't think the jury is out on Matheson yet. I'm still okay. intrigued to uh, maybe see a little bit more of him. Uh, with that said, though, I really like the Penguins' D pairings. For it lasted for a game or two, but when they had, <laughs> when they had Ricola and Ruedel on their third pairing, Dumoulin and Latang on the top pairing, and then Pedersen and Marino on the second pairing, that that is what I like. And obviously, like I said, I wanted to see more of Matheson, but that is probably my optimal defense going for the rest of the season if they have all their bodies or john marino stuck with uh cody cc um um you know because because I, I have been watching marino and i know his metrics are, are way down from 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 last season and he was the guy that i was most optimistic about um how much of of his uh rough start to his season is associated with him a playing off his offhand and then b also having to carry cody cc uh, yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with it. And his uh, possession numbers, his expected goals numbers were kind of starting to dip uh, before he got paired with CC. Mm -hmm. He did have a couple of good games, I think two or three games to start the season. Um, but trying to carry Cody CC in a second pairing role is, is not going to do anybody any good. And especially for a guy like him, I know they had him playing the left side last year with, with Latang a little bit when Dumoulin was down. Um, but that really affects defensemen a lot more than I think some people realize. And yeah, some guys are able to do it, but that doesn't always mean they should. Um, and I think Marino's a guy that maybe they can do that, but it's asking way too much for them to expect him to carry CC. Yeah, I was going to say playing with a tank's a hell of a lot different than playing right. with Cody CC. <laughs> yeah. Another thing I think people are kind of not paying as much attention to is that that pairing is playing with the Malkin line for the most part. Oh, okay. So not only do you have CC out there with the Malkin line, but then when they're in the offensive zone, you've also got a right shot over on the left side. So that changes things in the way you operate in the offensive zone. So, the for, like piggybacking of the whole defensive talk. I know that uh, Dumoulin and Marino were both absent of practice today. Do, has there been an update? I, I haven't had a chance to really look at anything since uh, since this afternoon. Has there been an update on their status? Are we seeing? Are like are they going to be a longer term again, or like, do we know? Um, as far as I know, I 
think Dumoulin is still being evaluated and I don't remember seeing anything about Marino at all. If there was some information, it probably got lost in the wave of Rutherford news, but I have not seen any update on him. Yeah, Marino is fine. Dumoulin is expected to probably miss a couple of games. That's about it. So we're, we're okay there. Um, but right now they're missing Pedersen, Dumoulin, and Ricola, which was really weird that they signed a right-handed defenseman when they have three left-handed defensemen injured. Right. <laughs> that, that was the, I, I think that was the thing I saw on Twitter that, that didn't bode well for uh, for Marino, uh, them signing a, a right-handed defenseman. But I mean, Yeah, no, there's nothing here. I'm looking at Taylor yeah. House, and she has nothing about Marino, so that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I the last I saw was uh, Mike DeFebo from the Gazette. Uh, John Marino and Brian Dumoulin absent from Penguins practice as injuries piles up. Uh, so, yeah, that was Jesus, the last, yeah, a- that's the last thing I saw. Like I said, I don't uh, – I don't know if that's a longer term thing or if that was maintenance, but um, I guess it's something to monitor. Uh, they can't afford to lose any more defensemen, man. This is, I mean, this is definitely worst case scenario What's, already. What, what are we? Are we concerned about Chris Letang yet? Because I'm, I'm like the biggest Chris Letang stand there is, but I, I even I can't really defend. He hasn't been good. <laughs> I can't defend any. I guy literally last night. I, it's one of those things where like I know pe- people like there's people that. Well, like Tang and Ben Roethlisberger are the two most polarizing athletes. When when they do bad, it's people. It's like it's like a holiday for some people. But like even last night, I could. There's nothing I could say. Like I was like, yeah, latang has been shit. I I don't know what what are, what are you seeing? What are the uh, numbers showing us as far as Latang's game? I mean, are are you just seeing a total regression, or is it just bad decisions? Uh, well, as far as his numbers go, the, the Penguins have not been good with him on the ice. Um, I think they're controlling around 40% of the expected goals, which is nowhere near where anybody in the lineup should be, let alone where Latang should be. Yeah. Um, I don't specifically know what's wrong with his game other than some of the boneheaded decisions he's making. Like there, there was a point last night where they were – well, when he took a penalty at the end of the game, he was the last guy back skating the puck up the ice and he just threw it right into the four checkers feet. So, you know, those kinds of things are, are costing them momentum. Uh, you know, he ends up taking away a power play right there and eventually puts them on the kill. So I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what to expect from him going forward because he's also at an age right now where it, it isn't necessarily out of line for a guy like him to regress. Uh, you look at guys like Drew Doughty were, who were up there at, you know, the elite level for years, and then he turns 30 and all of a sudden he's junk. So Latang's 33. It's not out of the realm of possibility that he's not as effective as he once was. With that being said, trading him is pointless. They're not going to get the value they need out of him. There's nobody on the market they're going to get that's going to be able to replicate what he does or – anybody out there that they can put into his role and expect better results. So I, I think they're just kind of stuck with whatever happens. I don't know what's going to happen. I hope he gets it together, but it's, it certainly hasn't been an encouraging start. Yeah. I'm, I'm generally not one of the guys who are going to talk about uh, all of the hockey buzzwords like compete level and tenacity and, um, you know, resilience and all that kind of stuff. Grit. But I, yeah, grit. <laughs> But I do think it is a testament to I don't I maybe I guess Mike Sullivan or just the leadership on this hockey team that you know uh, Latang has been playing the worst hockey we've seen him play in years. Malkin has been you know aside from a couple of shifts he's been invisible. Uh, the, even like the two of them at the same time on that uh, three on O the other uh, last night it was just <laughs> uh, how you don't even get a shot off I don't understand. And the fact that this team is four, two, and one at this point with two of their top three players, two or at least their top five players, two of their top five players playing like just trash is incredible to me that they're, they're, you know, winning these games in overtime. They're taking these games to overtime, winning these games in shootouts, and they're, they're just fighting back. And they're, I, I don't know how every time I watch them win, it's like, I don't know how the Penguins won that game, but they did. <laughs> and um, I, that's the one thing I think if there's a, a bright spot with this team this year is, how they are uh, dealing with a lot of adversity. 
Yeah, and I mean, it, it seems to be a common sentiment that you always want to go through the adversity at some point toward the beginning to, to the middle of the season. You don't want to be dealing with that adversity as the season's winding down or even in the playoffs. So there's something to be said for that. Um, but I'll sit here and tell you that the way they're playing is not sustainable for them to even make a playoff spot, let alone win a playoff round or even compete for the cup. They're, they're nowhere close to that right now. And I know their record looks shiny, but – two shootout wins those very easily could have been overtime losses and the record looks a hell of a lot different and we're having a much different conversation absolutely so we're like that's a, you bring up a good point with the playoffs um you know they're not if they keep playing this way you're right they're they're not making the playoffs in this division so let's play the hypothetical game say they miss the playoffs this year do we chalk this up to uh it was covid it was whatever or do we uh is it time to look at the same questions that the Steelers are looking at and start saying, okay, where do we need to rebuild? What do we do with some of these aging stars? Um, you know, do we, uh, do we start looking at trying to, uh, to, to initiate the rebuild or, you know, send the letter that the Rangers ownership sent out? How close are we to that? Um, I'm not exactly sure how close we will be to that because of the moves that have been made over the past couple of years. So if, if they truly wanted to tear things down, you're probably not going to be able to move contracts like a Mike Matheson, who's got another five or six years at 5 million. You're not going to be able to move a Brandon Tanev contract. Who's got another four and a half years left at his cap hit. So you've got a lot of money tied up and then you've got, you know, your, your buyouts, and then you've got your retained salary on the Bugstad trade. So I'm not exactly sure how much a, a rebuild or tearing things down would do for them right now. I, I think that the moves that Rutherford has made over the past couple of years has really made their bed and they're going to have to sleep in it until so everything goes away. That, that, I guess that's the follow-up then. Is this then just a situation where what Chad said at the beginning of this segment, um, Rutherford kind of left the Penguins high and dry. Um, is that really, the, I mean, is that like, is that the reality we all kind of just have to accept that, you know, they were stubborn. They thought that they can compete and they didn't do it the right way over the last three years. And now we're just kind of stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that's kind of what it's shaping up to be, you know, Rutherford leaving the way he has, it's kind of like the, the kid you're playing baseball with and he throws the baseball through your, through your mom's window and he just runs out <laughs> he's gone. So he's like, it, it's not my window, not my house. I'm getting out of here. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely think that we're looking at a situation like that. Um, so let's, let's look at, there are, there are some positives though. I, I, every time we have someone on, we always, you know, we, we drill them with like, Hey, cause this is Pittsburgh. So we feed off of like, we want our teams all to be perfect. Yeah. yeah. All the negativity. We got it out of the way. There are some things that I, like the last week or so that I've, become more optimistic i want to get your feelings on this one is tristan jari has absolutely comp did a reverse 180 from his first two games he looks solid i still think that they need to get maybe a veteran backup um we we talked to sean tyranny last week about that but i'm encouraged by jari's play i think sid and i think you and i maybe talked about this on twitter that sid might actually still have one or two more seasons where he's in the heart conversation i think he's been fantastic this year and there's no way that Latang and Malkin can play any worse. So their play to me is at a bottom right now. I'd be shocked if they get worse. So if their play even improves drastically as far as, you know, five on five drive and play and, and creating chances. I mean, this team still has enough talent. Um, what, give me, give me like your two most encouraging things for our audience that you're, that you've looked at analytically, um, that you think that can still keep this team in that playoff hunt. Uh, it, it starts and ends with Crosby. He's, he's been really good this year. Um, he's driving play at both ends. You know, I know last year, a lot of people were making a big deal about his, uh, defensive shortcomings and how, and the season prior, he actually had a very good defensive season. It was one of the best in the league. And then he turns it around. He's not very good defensively. He's dealing with injuries. Um, but I really think the Jack Johnson effect was working in full right there. And I know there are, um, you know, public models that attempt to isolate that. But I think with a guy like Jack Johnson, it might not be adjusting for him enough. So um, 
you know, Crosby's been really good this year. He hasn't been getting the the pucks to find the back of the net at 5v5, but with a guy like him, especially playing with Gensel and Rust, you would have to think that the goals are going to start coming eventually. Yeah, no, I, I think – and I think, yeah, two years ago, that's whenever – there was a, like a, a small campaign that I was on Twitter. Uh, I thought he deserved a, a Selkie nomination. He was so good. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was two years ago and he, he didn't get it, unfortunately. But, uh, and then what's your thoughts on, on Jari and, and the Penn's goaltending situation? Yeah. Jari's last few starts have been super encouraging and he obviously wasn't great uh, in those games. Against- yeah, he was bad. <laughs> <laughs> he was bad in those games against Philly. Um, it's, it's hard to chalk up how much of that was him being terrible and how much, you know, the pens were just disoriented all over the place, but I'm very encouraged by his last few starts. Um, I don't know that he's going to be a guy that's going to be, you know, a, a top five, top 10 net minder in the league, but they don't need him to be that they need him to be average and, and stop what's expected of him. And I think they will be all right. Are you uh, in the same boat as uh, tyranny that you think that maybe looking, trying to look at the, the veteran goalie market would be a smart move? Um, not necessarily. I'm okay with the Smith. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think he was great in the games he played either. Um, but I think he's an okay option. I don't really see with the Penguins cap situation why they would need to go out and spend more money. Um, but that certainly changes if for, if for whatever reason Jari's play you know starts to tank again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not see DeSmith as a guy that will carry them or take them anywhere in the playoffs. So if if Jari falters, then yes, they need to go get another guy. But I don't think at this point they need to. Ed? Uh, no, I forgot to unmute myself. Sorry. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Yeah, I didn't want people to listen uh, listen to me drinking. So, no, but uh, yeah, I – um. I mean, there's definitely things to be encouraged about for sure. And and I think you're right, Chad, that this is Pittsburgh. We always – we want championships or nothing. You know, it, it's, it's kind of just how we, we are. Um, but I do think that at, at the end of the day, we're seven games into a, a, a really weird season, uh, and they're 4-2-1. and one. And like, like Danny said, there's a lot to be um, desired from those four wins. Uh, they are definitely not what you would want ideally, but um, – if they can turn some things around, I, I think that uh, I think this is still a playoff team if they can get healthy and, and have a couple of players just, you know, get to their average play level. They don't even need to be, you know, Malkin doesn't have to be the best player in the NHL. Latang doesn't have to be a top five defenseman. They, they just have to play average. They just have to play a little better than they are now. And I think that this is a playoff team. I think they're. I think that's their ceiling, though. I think that's probably the the problem that we're we're not used to having. This is that we're used to the, thinking like, hey, yeah, you know, the, the you know, we have Crosby, Malkin, Latang. They they have a shot to win a cup. I I think that window is is damn near. If it's not all the way closed, it's it's like cracked to the smallest extent. Um, I'd be sh- I'd be shocked if they got past the first round this year. I don't, I don't know about you guys. I mean, Danny seems to feel the same way. Unless Jari shocks the world and becomes this elite playing out of his mind, Matt Murray, 937 save percentage. I, 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 watching them play Boston and Philly, who I think are the, the two best teams in the division, I, I, I would, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to FanDuel and depositing money and betting against the Penguins if they play either of them in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, when, when the Penguins are clicking, there's no doubt that they can hang with those teams. And, and like the Penguins proved last night against Boston, is that they can score a couple of quick goals when they need to. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I really think teams like Boston are just more structured. And with how inconsistent the Penguins are from, you know, period to period at a time, I have a hard time seeing them hanging around in a seven-game series against a team that's as structured as Boston. I, ju- I just don't see it. And it has a, as good as a goalie as Boston does. I mean, say what you will about Tuka Rask, but I've always felt that he was a, a top a top tier goalie, and he certainly plays like that every time he plays the Penguins. Yeah, I mean, he was showing it last night. The the Penguins were really pushing there in the third, and he made a couple of miraculous saves to keep the game scoreless before they finally ended up scoring. But it, it was just like, oh my god, how is he stopping that? And why why are these not going in? So. 
Um, but you're right. If the Penguins can get that from Jari and maybe capture lightning in a bottle and they go on a, a goal scoring bender as well, because hockey's weird like that. And sometimes the pucks are just fine in the back of the net as much as of a cliche that might be. It's just the truth and the nature of the game with how random it is. Yeah. See, for me, I guess I look at it a, a little bit differently. I'm a little bit more optimistic, I'll say, because, um, and, and maybe this is the Yinzer goggles. I'm completely open to that, but, uh, the thing that I always look at is, you know, I've, I've watched this team go on tears in the regular season and then lose in the first round. And then I've seen situations where, you know, in 09 when they won the cup and then um, in six, the second of these last two where they weren't a good – like we didn't think that they were a good hockey team. I mean, you know, even the, the first of the back-to-backs, they, they fired their coach again. You know, like um, this is not one of those teams where – I think that they're going to be like the Tampa Bay Lightning and just go, you know, wire to wire and dominate from the beginning of the season all the way into the playoffs. I'm completely okay with them getting in as like, you know, a you know, a bottom or a wild card seed and then turning it on when they need to. The question is can Crosby and Malkin and Latang still find that switch? I still think they can for another couple of years, but that's kind of what I'm banking on is that, okay, look, this is the regular season. Get into the playoffs. That's all we need you guys to do is get into the playoffs. And then they know what it takes <coughs> in the, you know, when it really matters and, and they can turn it on. And that's, that's kind of what I, what I'm expecting to see from this team this year. I'm just worried that Malkin's washed. I, I don't know, but I, I I'm, I'm worried. I he is, man. We've, we've no? seen this from him. No, nah, we've seen this from him, you know, yeah, but times he, where he where he sucks and it's it's trade Malkin, it's get rid of him, it's he's done. He's, you know, I'm not like that. Yeah, I, no, I know he's you're gonna, not. He's going to be turning 35 no, this year. I, I still mean, I still think he's. You know, we we talked to Jesse Marshall, but uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, and Jesse Marshall said that Malkin was in the best shape of his life. It was you could tell that he put on some muscle and he was just a different. I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's time to hit the hit the you know the worry button with Malkin yet. I just think he's in a slump. I think he's in one of those Malkin slumps, and I think he's going to bounce back. And, and I think he, you know, midway through the season, we're going to be looking back at this and like, I can't believe he played like that. Yeah, I mean, after the start he's had, it's easy to forget that he was one of the best players in the NHL last year. He was a point per game guy, yeah. Yeah, he had, what, 77 points in 55, 56 games, something like that. So uh, we, we can't write him off like that coming off a season like that. And with a guy like him who's at his age now, um, I really wonder how much not having a full training camp and a preseason to get prepared for the season is affecting them. And, yeah, they should probably be getting into the swing of things by now, but they normally play four or five preseason games on top of a full training camp. So if you think about it, right now is really where at the point where things are getting going. I'm not into the TMZ stuff, but there is a rumor that he has the SADs right now because his family is – and they're living in Florida, so he hasn't been seeing his his kid and his his wife. Um, so he might have the sads. The thing that worries me about this team is not Malkin or Latang's play or anything like that. It's the injuries. I mean, like every year we we seem to go through this with this hockey team. We, <laughs> they're we cursed. Always lead the, the league in, uh, in in man games lost. And if it was spread out, you know, like maybe a forward or two and a couple of defensemen, I, I wouldn't be concerned. But the problem is we have – if Marino and Dumoulin are out, so that's, what, five defensemen now that we're down, if I'm if my, if my math is right? Right. We don't – like this isn't Malkin and Crosby in their mid-20s to where they can play that full, you know, full ice game. I think well, I think Sid still can, but yeah. But I mean, I don't know that he can sustain that for an entire season, and and that's what worries me is that if we are going to be down this many defensemen for longer term, as uh, Sullivan likes to say, that's what concerns me is those man games lost and maintaining in a in a fifty five game season, maintaining that you know being able to say okay, well we're going to keep this up, we're going to keep. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna fall behind the rest of the pack because I think once you fall behind the pack in this division, you're you're kind of screwed, and that's what concerns me more than anything is is the injuries and what that's gonna do in the next month or two, uh, versus the play. You know, any kind of playoff concerns. Yeah, and I think it comes down to how long guys like Pedersen and Rico are really gonna be out because 
the fact of the matter is that if they're going into a playoff series or trying to secure a playoff spot down the stretch with Cody CC, Yannick Weber, and Kevin Church <laughs> in your lineup, you're you're just not going to do it. It's not going <laughs> to. So, um, I think if you get by with having a couple of those guys injured, but with with they've basically got all of their defense, all of their left defensemen hurt right now, so you just can't win that way. Hey, Danny, so we're going to let you go soon, but I th- I talked to you about this earlier. I wanted to get in, uh, you, you know, you were, you are right for the Penn's blog. I go way back with Penn's blog. I'm talking 2013. I had this little rivalry with Adam and Derek. Derek really didn't like me. Adam didn't like me, but now we're like friends and we've gone to like Pirates games together and stuff like that. How'd you get, uh, how'd you get involved with Penn's blog? Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. Try not to take up too much. No, you're good. But uh, back when I was in middle school, I started blogging about the Pirates and Penguins. I had my own, like, blog spot. Yep. Um, blog, whatever. <laughs> so I was doing that. And, you know, a couple months went by, and all of a sudden I was writing for, you know, a couple websites, a couple hockey websites. I was covering all kinds of stuff. And then I started getting a little bit older. I lost my passion for it, didn't really have any interest in it anymore. And then at the beginning of last hockey season, I made a new Twitter account and started and I had had an account previously and I kind of knew some people from Pittsburgh Twitter or whatever. So mm. I, kinda, I just started interacting with them a little bit. And I think a couple weeks into the season, I wrote an article about Hornquist and I had a bunch of people reaching out to me saying like, hey, I really like that article. Like, good job, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, thanks. Like, I, I just kind of threw <laughs> I, I had a hankering to do it. Yeah. And then I wrote a couple more pieces over the next couple months. And then I was actually talking to uh, Jeff from Penn's blog. Yep. And uh, I was talking to him about a Greg Wyshynski tweet where he was kind of uh, taking some jabs at Penn's blog. <laughs> and uh, kind of just messaged Jeff and, you know, was, was talking to him a little bit about that. And I was like, hey, by the way, do you guys happen to need any writers at Penn's blog? And he was like, actually, a matter of fact, we do. Mm-hmm. And I've been with them since. I've been loving it. Yeah. So I talked to Jesse about this because and, and, and trust me, I'm allowed to say this because, again, me and Adam are friends. But like it, it's they're, the transition of Penn's blog in a decade and a half. I, I think actually Penn's 2007, it might go back to, they were like the, the, the first blog. I give them full credit. Everybody knew the Penn's blog. Everybody did. And they're, they're, in, they're they impacted me when I was in high school. I did your story sounds so familiar. Cause I did a four, one, two sports talk. That's what I made my website. And then I got, I was writing for bleach report. Don't hold that against me, but they, I was writing for bleach report. And then, some other guys from Twitter were starting a website called Penn's Initiative. And I kind of like became into the fold with them. And it's funny you mentioned Greg because he actually hired my old blog, Penn's Initiative, to write this like the best, I think it was the best Penguins player from every country. So if you go on Yahoo, there's there's a Mad Chat article about Yager and I talked about him having peanut butter. But it's been really fun to watch the Penn's blog transition from like a meme website to like, you guys are actually like what I would consider, you know, I have my little bookmarks of where I go for information. And I think, you know, you guys take the, the analytics and analyzing the game a lot more serious. Now, Jesse was a big part of that whenever they hired Jesse Marshall to come over there, but it's been nice to, to see the transition there. So, um, and I'm not kissing your ass because you're on a show, but it, it just as a, a guy that has a history of Penn's blog, it's been nice to watch you guys transition from being a meme website to actually writing hockey analysis. And we all know that Pittsburgh needs good hockey analysis because you're not going to get it from, from a lot of the, uh, the bigger names out there. So you, uh, you said you used to do some pirates writing. What's your thoughts on these uh, last couple of trades? (laughs) Uh, Well, to tell you the truth, since I've gotten into hockey analytics, I, it has really changed my fandom of the pirates and Steelers because I used to sit there and go, Oh, the, the Steelers just signed this, you know, offensive tackle. I'd sit there and tell you why it was a good or bad signing. Now mm. I, I know that I don't know. So I try to not take it, I, I try to not take it as seriously. Uh, you know, the Pirates are making these trades and getting all these prospects that I've never heard of. I'm not going to sit here and say I know anything about them. 
Um, I'm going to be happy if they win. I'll be upset if they <laughs> lose. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to go into, you know, analyzing anything like I do for the Penguins. Sure. Sure. Definitely. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll make sure we link uh, your Twitter, your, I mean, everybody that knows the show knows the Pens blog, but uh, we'll still make sure that the Pens blog gets shouted out uh, more than once. Uh, thank you so much for your, you know, coming on and talking Pens hockey with us and uh, hopefully we can do it again. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. I had a great time. I will uh, join you guys anytime. All right, Danny, again, this is Danny Shirey with uh, Pens blog. Uh, you can find him. We'll throw those Twitters out there right uh, the Twitter account out there right now. It's uh, Shirey Irving, and that's S H I R E Y I R V I N G. Danny, thanks again for coming on, brother. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to 412 Sports Talk. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you like the show, leave us a review and be sure to tell a friend about your source for all things Pittsburgh sports. Find us on Twitter at MadChad412 and at Eddie underscore P underscore 412.